Let's look at the top five most important weapons for besieging or attacking a medieval castle. Hey folks, so we're going to look at the top five most important weapons as I see them for besieging or attacking a medieval castle. Now before I go on, I must mention that this video is kindly sponsored by The Great Courses Plus and I'm going to tell you more about a special offer from them much later on and also what a great service they provide. So I'm Matt Easton, I'm a um, historian, former archaeologist, and I've spent the last pretty much 20 to 30 years um, studying medieval history and warfare. In the course of my academic and personal career, I've of course come across many, many hundreds of manuscript images of sieges. And in those images we see certain themes coming out. Now there are a lot of um, popular preconceptions and misconceptions, it has to be said, about medieval sieges and medieval warfare. Some of those brought about by uh, misunderstanding from historians in the past, but more commonly it's due to the way that sieges are represented in thing lo things like movies and TV series. In fact, if we look at medieval manuscripts, we can actually find a lot of details about medieval sieges. And of course, if we study the actual history of how these sieges panned out, uh, then we can get a far more rounded view of how medieval siege warfare actually worked. So for the purposes of this video I'm going to be using mostly manuscript images and looking at what I consider to be the five most prominent or uh, dominant important weapons used for besieging medieval castles. So there is a potentially a whole nother video looking at the defensive weapons used by the defenders in the castle. And the nature of attacking a castle versus defending a castle very, very different because of course the defenders have uh, a stockpile of um, ammunition but they might not be able to uh, replenish it. Obviously they've got limited resources in there but they are in an incredibly strong defensive position. And you shouldn't underestimate what force magnifiers medieval castles were. In some cases the garrisons for medieval castles were actually quite small but they were able to hold out for long enough against far bigger forces while the uh, their allied forces came to their aid and rescue essentially. This of course brought a particular challenge for the attackers therefore. You might have a superior number of um, fighting individuals but you would have to bring certain weapons to bear to be able to stand any chance of taking that castle. I also want to point out of course that most medieval sieges, or certainly many medieval sieges, were actually decided by other factors than weapons. They were decided by things like uh, disease or bribery or spies or um, sometimes being able to set fire to things, um, even uh, the running out of resources, starvation. Sometimes even the weather in some cases played an important part. But what we're not going to look at is the medieval siege as an entire thing in this video. We're just going to look at five incredibly important weapons that were used in actually assailing or attacking medieval fortifications. So to start off with number one, and this is in no particular order incidentally, I've decided not to rank these one to five because it was too difficult. Many of these weapons have to work in conjunction with other ones and I'll talk about that as we go along. But number one is a very humble object, an object that many of you may own. Can you think what it might be? It's a ladder. It's as simple as that. It's a ladder. Now you might think, well, that's not a siege weapon. It actually is. Uh, not only were normal ladders used, but you've got to bear in mind that the sorts of ladders that had to be used in medieval siege warfare were very often much longer ladders than a standard ladder. Um, additionally, they were sometimes uh, sort of more robustly built, reinforced. Sometimes they even had hooks and other arrangements on the top of them to make it more difficult for the defenders to push the ladders away and this kind of thing. But ladders were insanely important throughout the entire history of um, siege warfare, going all the way back probably to prehistory. So as soon as you get humans making fortifications, you get basically people trying to climb over them. <laughs> because the easiest way to try and bypass a fortification for a normal human is to climb over it. And obviously a ladder, if you have invented ladders, which have, ladders have obviously been around uh, for a very, very long time. If you have ladders, then ladders are a very good way to bypass those fortifications. So we see ladders used just colossally in the medieval art um, and they're actually not mentioned much in the texts. Um, escalade is a term which usually means you know climbing um, and usually would have involved ladders but the ladders themselves are not spoken about a lot in the written sources but they are shown in the artistic sources. Hugely massively important and 
When we go back to the early medieval period, in fact, before the classical kind of period of what you would think of as uh, the, the high, medi high Middle Ages or the high medieval period, if we go back to the early um, medieval period, the migration era, we actually see people like migration era people such as the um, Angles and Saxons, the, what later became known as the Anglo-Saxons, uh, besieging places like um, Roman Londinium uh, in the late Roman era. And you think, well, what technology did they have available to themselves? They had ships, they had this and that, but they didn't have giant siege engines, which we'll talk about later. They didn't have um, a huge amount of technology, but they would have had ladders uh, and ropes, of course. Um, although ropes aren't shown very much, actually, in the medieval art, certainly in the later medieval art. So ladders, hugely important. There's not an awful lot more to say about them, but you should never underestimate how important a ladder is. So next up at number two, and this is a more obvious thing that m most of you probably will have immediately thought of uh, when I told you what the topic of this video was, and that is artillery. Now, when I say artillery, most of you will think of howitzers or large guns used in the world wars or in the modern day. But in fact, of course, artillery refers to any type of uh, missile uh, shooting device which is large and usually crewed by several people. So this obviously goes back all the way back into antiquity. Famously, the Romans used things like uh, ballista and various torsion-powered engines. But in the medieval period, which was what we're looking at here, probably the most famous item of artillery is the trebuchet and uh, various people around the world have made replica trebuchets and demonstrated what these things can do. We also know what they can do from the written sources. Edward I was quite famous in his wars in Scotland for using uh, trebuchet and trebuchet are actually shown quite a lot in art. So um, and they're not just shown in Europe incidentally so I'm focusing here on medieval Europe but it should be mentioned that trebuchet are to be found um, all over the um, Islamic, as well, Islamic world as well in North Africa in the Middle East all the way to um, all over Asia. So um, the fact is that the trebuchet was used pretty much everywhere and it's a fairly simple piece of gear. It's essentially a counterweight with an arm, a lever, but then with the addition essentially of a sling on the end, which is again, it's a force magnifier or it's an accelerating arm at the end. So it's, it's a relatively simple thing. It's big, it's cumbersome. It takes, um, it, it takes a certain amount of resources to construct and transport one. And then you need to deploy it. You need to build it at the site, probably while being under arrow fire from the um, opponents. Uh, so there are certain challenges to using them, but very often, certainly in medieval European warfare, they were a decider in a siege when the trebuchets turned up, uh, rumour has it, legend has it, that in many cases um, the defending castle dwellers, the, the people in the fortification, basically went, OK, there's nothing we can do now. Our allied forces haven't arrived, arrived to relieve us, so it's better to surrender rather than be smashed to smithereens or have our fortifications smashed, smashed to smithereens by the trebuchets. Because, of course, if you were an attacking force, you were more likely to be merciful on a um, settlement or fortification that had surrendered rather than one that had put up a bitter fight to the to the last. Um, so uh, the trebuchet, hugely, hugely important, shown in tons of manuscripts, medieval manuscripts. But of course, there are other types of um, artillery in use at the time. There are torsion powered engines. Now, torsion powered engines catapult, ballista type things, uh, were, seem to have been relatively far more popular in the ancient era, um, used famously by the Romans, of course, um, but numerous other people as well. And they did still exist in the medieval era, and we do find written references for them. Uh, however, certainly in most of Europe, uh, certainly most of Western Europe, uh, they, they don't seem to have ever been as popular or common as the uh, counterweight trebuchet. So, but torsion powered engines shooting giant arrows and of course stones as well did exist they just weren't as popular as trebuchet now the medieval era you might not think about it but guns are actually uh, something quite important in the medieval era from the 14th century onwards so um, already at the battle of Cressy we hear a reference to the use of a, a large what we'd now call a cannon um, 
They weren't particularly effective on the battlefield yet, probably because of the way that they were built and had to be transported. They couldn't be uh, uh, sort of manoeuvred around like later field artillery could. Um, so, uh, but they were useful in siege warfare where they could be deployed and they could take their time shooting um, and reloading and they didn't have to move around and change their um, what they were aiming at very often. So um, in siege warfare, already in the 14th century, we start to find that uh, large guns are very important and in 15th century manuscripts they are shown absolutely loads um, the, all different types of large artillery pieces large guns are shown in 15th century manuscripts and of course they were primarily used for smashing the walls or smashing gatehouses so that you could gain entrance um, and storm with your soldiers into the fortification and of course we should mention in uh, 14 53, um, the um, fall of Constantinople, which was uh, largely brought about by the arrival of the Ottoman Turkish guns. So though the very, very massive, in fact, some of them uh, survived, there's, there's a couple in uh, the Royal Armourers collection here in the UK. Um, these very large cast bronze guns that were used by the Ottomans were incredibly important in the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, all types of artillery, whether it's trebuchet or torsion powered, sort of old fashioned uh, artillery, all the way through to uh, muzzle loading guns, and in fact, some cases, breech loading guns in the 14th and 15th centuries, incredibly important in siege warfare, particularly towards the end of the medieval period. Now we're just going to have a short break to talk about The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a subscription on demand service that you can watch on your TV, on your phone, on your PC. The Great Courses Plus has lectures from top professors from universities in the Ivy League and other great universities from around the world. Also um, organisations like National Geographic, the Smithsonian and so on. The Great Courses Plus is amazing for me because there's a lot of topics that I'm expanding into that I don't know that much about at the moment and basically everything I've looked for so far I've found something of relevance on The Great Courses Plus which enables me to scale up my knowledge, my context uh, and to bring that to you guys and improve my videos. On The Great Courses Plus you can get access to over 11,000 lectures. 11,000! You can learn more about cooking, about science, about maths, about literature, history, philosophy, uh, loads of different stuff, uh, photography even. You know, one of the courses I've been watching is on the Mongol Empire, which of course is incredibly important to understand both from a medieval European perspective, but also from a um, Asian perspective as well, because the Mongol Empire had an impact on Europe, but also on uh, Japan and obviously China, uh, even India. So the fact is that understanding the expansion of the Mongol Empire is incredibly important to understand understanding that entire period of history. The lecturer is Dr. Craig Benjamin from Grand Valley State University and uh, it's got a really good feel to it and, and I've got to say it's got 24 um, parts to it so it's incredibly in-depth. You know it's funny watching uh, one of the parts of the um, lecture series the Xiong Nu um, who I've talked about in talking about the um, early Chinese swords that I consider in some of my videos is very interesting because the question comes up about uh, is the Shong Nu uh, whose ethnic identity or everything about them really is debated how related are they to lo later uh, Turkic and their Mongol um, sort of migrations of people so it, in fact it connects into not just the medieval world but even it goes all the way back as well and really puts the Mongols into their full historical context and touches on huge number of other bits of history so you can check out your free trial now by clicking the link below or by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash scholargladiatoria and you've got nothing to lose it's a free trial go and check out the insane amount of stuff on there you can just go into the search bar and search for anything that um, is of interest to you and I'm sure you're going to find something on there so thanks for sticking with me now let's get back to this uh, five most important weapons of medieval siege warfare. Now at number three, you should never underestimate the importance of bows, crossbows, and handheld firearms. So in other words, simple battlefield um, missile weapons. So the sort of things that would have been used at the Battle of Agincourt or any of the other famous battles of the uh, medieval era, and it obviously goes all the way back again to antiquity. These, certainly in the case of bows, were not new weapons. 
Uh, spears and javelins thrown less of uh, seem to be less prominent. They were shown more in the hands of defenders because, of course, a defender is high up on walls and they can throw things down at people who are near to the wall. Um, but of course, if you're attacking people up on walls, you can't throw a javelin uh, far enough to uh, be particularly useful against people up on walls who are shooting crossbows back at you. Um, but there are ways you can mitigate that, but we'll talk about that in one of the other weapons which is coming up. But bows and crossbows, and in the 14th and 15th, particularly the 15th century and later, um, handheld firearms, incredibly important at attacking the people up on the top of the fortification. But perhaps more importantly than just literally attacking them, um, is actually keeping them down off the top of the fortification. And when I spoke earlier about weapons being used in conjunction, think about ladders. And now when your forces are putting the ladders up against the wall and storming up the ladders and attempting to gain control of the top of the fortifications, what you do is covering fire. Now I know that archers out there will be uh, wringing their hands because I'm using the word fire here because of course there's no fire involved with the bow or a crossbow, uh, but it's an expression. So covering fire while your troops do something else. Incredibly important and really storming with ladders, you could argue, unless you've just got colossally greater number of uh, humans and ladders than the defenders, in most situations having bows, crossbows and later on handheld firearms keeping a withering fire down on the walls to keep the defenders off the top of the walls is kind of what makes escalade by siege ladders possible. So ladders and archers, or um, gunners in some cases, working together, working in unison, joint forces, have to, uh, have to recognise that you can't separate these things and one probably doesn't work very well without the other. But nevertheless, Archers, um, longbowmen, crossbowmen, this kind of thing, um, very, very important all the way from antiquity and continuing to be important right until the end of the medieval era. Now in at number four is a weapon, but it's a weapon of defense. But again, it's one of these weapons which is incredibly important in linking in with the other weapons that are being used. And in this case, it's the pavis or large shield. I won't say only pavis. Now what is a pavis? It's a large rectangular-ish shield, usually curved. Usually it's quite heavy and thick to resist um, bow, um, arrows and crossbow bolts. Um, and in some cases, maybe shrapnel if there are things like early forms of grenade and explosive being used. Um, and these large shields, they can be carried, they can be used as hand weapons, but they are large and cumbersome and heavy, and they're usually used stood on the ground, most famously for crossbowmen, um, perhaps even gunners in some case, to load their weapons behind. So it's essentially, it's an it's a arrow, or should we say missile weapon shield, um, which is almost like a portable wall. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that concept in a minute. Um, and, but these large shields, we do also see them being used, of course, by the people using the ladders. So here again, we come into joint operations uh, way of viewing things. So large shields, not only were they good for missile troops to reload their weapons behind, or just for the attacking forces to shelter behind before the attack, but in addition, when these forces were actually attacking, in the case of if there's a breach in a wall uh, created by the uh, cannons, for example, or if there's ladders, lots of ladders have been thrown up against the walls and your attacking forces are going up them, carrying large shields in front of them are incredibly important, like hugely important, you can't, you can't overstate it. Uh, in the success of that escalade. So there are several things that want to happen at the same time if you're throwing ladders up, for example. Your archers are gonna be shooting arrows as much as they can at the people on top of the walls. The ladders go up and then your people storm up it with large shields, but the large shields are a very much important part of the success of that attack. Now at number five, the final one is something which I think a lot of people don't think of and probably some people don't even know about, and that is, external fortification. So what do I mean by that? Well, actually it can mean several things, okay? So on a simple level, it could just mean those pavises we were talking about, so shelters. And we sometimes see in medieval art, uh, lots of people standing around outside the castle who are attacking it with pavises. Sometimes there are larger wooden um, hoardings that have been put up. And sometimes, and this was something that goes back all the way to Roman siege um, warfare, the attacking force would actually settle down for a prolonged siege and they would build their own fortification 
around the fortification they were besieging. Now, clearly they didn't have time to do it in stone, in, certainly in most cases, um, but so they had to have to throw up something quickly. And in many cases, they would come with prefabricated things that they could throw up hoardings and such like. In addition, they'd probably dig trenches. Um, so you'd probably have uh, some degree of trench entrenching, and then you'd have some degree of palisading as well. So think a little bit about a Norman Motten Bailey uh, castle thrown up quickly uh, to control an area. This is the sort of thing you'd see, but it would have to lap around in most cases, depending on the geographical features, because the castle itself might not be accessible from all sides anyway. Uh, but the, the fortification would essentially want to seal in the, the besieged fortification. Uh, and in medieval art, if we look at 15th century manuscripts, for example, this very often seems to consist of wooden palisades and wooden towers with wooden hoardings and um, sort of roofs, essentially. And very often there are holes cut in these palisades so that you can put your guns in, so the attacking artillery, and guns are great for this because a trebuchet needs a lot of space for the arms to work, but a gun of course can just fit through a small hole um, and it can be pulled back to be reloaded or you can come around the front to reload it. Um, or if it's a breech loader, you can obviously load it from the back. Um, so in some cases, these fortifications had their own arrow loops on their own gun holes. Um, so they could actually essentially spring up their own fortification around the besieged fortification and almost fight it on even terms. Now connected to this attacking fortification idea is the idea of siege towers. Now siege towers are uh, something which are beloved of Hollywood because they look incredibly impressive on the silver screen. And they did exist, um, you know, they've existed since before the Roman era. Um, so absolutely moving towers on wheels did exist and they did still exist in the medieval period and the Renaissance and were still being built and used. As far as we know, they're certainly shown in medieval art. Although we have to throw in a small caveat there and um, express some caution with medieval art, because many cases when we look at a medieval manuscript, it's showing an event either from classical history, so Greek or Roman history or the Trojan Wars or something like that, or it's showing a biblical event. Um, so in many cases what they're showing in medieval art isn't necessarily what was being done at the time. They're sometimes trying to show what they perceived was done much earlier. But that aside, I think it's fair to say that siege towers existed and they were used, but not hugely often and not as much as Hollywood would maybe have you believe. What was more common was stationary fortifications around the besieged fortification. And from there, the attacking forces would, uh, would attack the, the besieged fortification in the numerous ways that we've spoken about with artillery, siege ladders, sallying out, all of this kind of thing. So those were what I consider to be the five most important medieval um, siege weapons for attackers. But I'm going to give three honourable mentions as well to other things, um, one of which I'm certain that you will have thought of and wondered why I didn't mention, and that is the ram. So again, the battering ram is something which is beloved of uh, video games and, and uh, movies and TV shows, and it's something that's got a really strong um, place, I think, in people's, in the public perception. But as far as I can tell, rams weren't actually used an awful lot in the medieval period for attacking fortifications. And I suspect part of this is because of how fortifications had been built in the medieval period. Now, it's fair to say that rams probably of a, a more manual nature, that is literally just you know logs that were picked up and used to bash in a door, uh, were used extensively. Um, but in terms of the classic idea of the battering ram with, uh, with a roof and wheels and, and all this kind of stuff, we do see it in medieval art. And very often it's associated with the siege towers in medieval art. So again, some of the time these are alluding to classical events, in other words, from Greek and Roman uh, histories, uh, or indeed biblical events. Events. So, in terms of were battering rams, were the you know the classic idea of the battering ram actually used in medieval warfare? I haven't seen an awful lot of evidence for it either in the art or in the um, written texts of the time. And I think the reason is because of the nature of medieval castles from the Motten Bailey Castle all the way forward mean that battering rams of that nature on wheels aren't very easy to deploy against medieval castles. But that being said, I think they probably did exist. They just weren't used an awful lot.
Now the second honorary mention is actually something which is really super important and nearly made it into my top five. Uh, but it's so mundane and so simple that I kind of thought, well, in a way it's not a weapon. And that is picks, shovels and axes, really tools. Okay. And this again alludes to what I said at the beginning of the video of what um, I'm looking at here is a, a weapons of attack. Now there are many ways of besieging a castle and taking it. And one of the very popular ways of taking a castle was to, to either destroy the gate. And that's why they went to great efforts to reinforce gates with portcullises and uh, obviously famously drawbridges and things like that. Um, but to get through doors and gates, portals made of wood essentially. Um, but additionally to mine under the castle. Now this was actually something which we have various uh, references to happening during sieges and very often it was happening at the same time as other things were going on as well. Uh, but the general outline is that um, you could either dig under a wall in order to create a song to come up inside the fortification somewhere to bypass the wall. Um, foundations, medieval foundations tended to, to not be as deep as we're used to in the modern world. Additionally, the other option was to dig under the wall uh, with wooden struts and then to set fire to those wooden struts uh, using um, oil or in some, some cases animals allegedly uh, to then uh, so you'd support, you'd essentially put um, support struts under the wall uh, as you mined and then you'd set fire to your own mine which would collapse the mine and collapse the wall. So this could be done and it was done and obviously the implements used for achieving that were picks, axes, shovels and so on, spades and things like this but they're not really weapons. But what I would say is that there is in art occasionally we do see picks and axes specifically being used directly against the walls or against the gates and it's difficult to disentangle whether this was literally being done in the open. Uh, it seems a little bit risky um, or whether it was more, they were more just representational in the medieval art of the fact that these people with tools were attacking the walls in various ways, often under the ground. Nevertheless, worth mentioning them. The very last thing I want to mention very, very briefly is the use of um, things like faggots and bundles of wood and uh, even pontoon type um, bridges to breach gaps. So when you've got something like a moat or even just a ditch, uh, very often filling it up with something and uh, faggots of wood was um, a popular way of doing this or just anything you could lay your hands in, chucking it into the ditch and that would enable you to get to the walls. But again, it's not really a weapon of attack, but I think it has an honourable mention number three nevertheless. So I hope this has been fun and interesting for you. It's certainly been fun for me compiling it and going through the images uh, and finding examples and also very very illuminating to me actually seeing how often certain things were shown or not shown uh, and definitely certain things are shown overwhelmingly in sieges even when there are no other siege objects or weapons shown you pretty much always get bows being shot and you pretty much always get ladders involved. Uh, so these things I think were, were actually the dominant despite the fact we know naturally think of trebuchets or battering rams or things like this when we talk about medieval sieges. I actually think fundamentally just uh, missiles of various sort, bows, uh, bow and cro bows and crossbows and guns and um, ladders were probably the most important things in most siege warfare. And remember as well of course that most sieges that happened weren't necessarily um, things that took a long period of time. Sometimes it was a, a small fortified town and they would just take it by storm and certainly there are many many accounts and I can think of accounts from the wars in North Wales and also the Hundred Years War in France where uh, English forces and in some cases Welsh forces just stormed the fortification and managed to get in before they could shut it essentially because they don't like lock the door the whole time. So literally if you can do a surprise attack uh, just by <laughs> charging the place uh, and getting in or getting over the wall as quickly as possible and this is one way of taking a fortification and once you're inside uh, then um, then you know that's that's a large amount of the of the achievement unlocked as it were um, but nevertheless I'd be very interested to hear your comments do you think there are certain weapons I should have included uh, or that I overlooked or I misrepresented I'm always happy to see your contributions underneath if you're not subscribed please consider doing so and give this video a like if you enjoyed it at all um, and I hope you did and lastly of course thanks again to the Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video sponsorship from uh, the Great Courses Plus very important to this channel and helps me to make more videos and longer videos for you guys to enjoy for free um, so check out the link below as well great offer 
highly, highly recommended. There's tons of stuff. There's more stuff on there than I can ever watch, unfortunately, uh, but there is loads of stuff on there that is hugely interesting. And if you if you enjoy this channel, I'm sure you'll enjoy The Great Courses Plus. So go and check it out. Um, thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you folks soon again on the channel for another video related to warfare or history or something like that. Cheers, folks. Thank you.